Welcome to Conscious Conversations. Uh, my name is Luke McLean. Uh, Conscious Conversations is a podcast that catches up with people who I feel are living from a real place of authenticity, of purpose, you know, with high amounts of self awareness and, and presence. And that could be in the space of leadership, wellness, coaching, spirituality, mindfulness, whatever the platform that really resonates with me is. It, it doesn't really matter. It's more about the person's journey. And, you know, I try and tell their story, I try and talk to their journey and connect to the tools, resources, insights and wisdom that they have and and give that to you guys, the audience, and as much to myself and I learn and grow from every podcast that I'm, you know, that I'm part of. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that. And especially through COVID, I feel like it's been a real grounding and healing process for me to be able to continue to connect with people and, and, and talk to them and learn from them throughout this time. So I really am grateful for that. Uh, you know, the, the podcast in many respects is an extension of the work that I do every day as a coach. I'm a life coach and I'm a meditation teacher. And I, I work with people to help them step into their authentic self, to find the tools and resource to sh- resources to show up with their intention, their purpose and their authenticity. And it's, it's really, it's a life's work for me because I feel like that's what a lot of people are missing. They're well-intentioned. They want to be the best versions of themselves, but they simply don't have either the the tools through you know through presence, through meditation, or the self awareness or the self understanding to make the shifts and transformations that they want to make. And they try and try, but they just don't have the space and the ability to do that. So you know, I support, provide accountability, and provide insights and wisdom to help people do that. And it's been really beautiful work that I've been able to step into. And again, I'm I'm really grateful for that. The podcast is really taking, you know, is really taking a step in the right direction. And today's guest, Amit Amit Podgar, um, you know, he has his Instagram site called Finding Awareness, which is one of the best um, is one of the best Instagram sites for quotes and for original writing that I've ever I've ever come across. Um, he's got 66,000 followers. He's got a, a, a blog as well, just called findingawareness.com. And Amit, you know, I reached out to him because he had inspired me so much and inspired so many people. And, you know, he hasn't got books out yet. He hasn't got, he started really from scratch just with these, you know, these beautiful insights from personal experiences and, and obviously from a lot of um, education and understanding around self awareness and presence and ego. He obviously is well versed in those areas, but his ability to articulate it is really beautiful. And you know, to get you know forty five minutes to fifty minutes with a mitt and talk to him and, and get inside his his thought stream and what he thinks and you know his beliefs was really was really inspiring for me. I walked away from it energized and you know with insight that sometimes you know I don't get all that often because I've I've done a lot of this work myself so I've read a lot of these books and I'm experiencing a lot of it but Amit added value so much value to my personal understanding of certain areas so I'm grateful for that and I'm you know I'm very confident that if you listen to this podcast you're going to find just nuggets of gold and understanding if you're into mindfulness if you're into meditation if you're into personal growth and self transformation this is a podcast, this is an episode that I reckon you could really learn and grow from, so I highly recommend it. Um, so super excited to get Amit on the podcast, he was awesome, you know, laid back, but with so much gold and so much understanding, so let's welcome Amit Padgar to Conscious Conversations. Amit, I, mean, I wanted to start... Just with what you know, what you offer, what you talk about on finding awareness, that it feels like you've got this really nice blend of meditation, mindfulness, and spiritual spirituality. But you're combining that in a, in almost like a coaching platform or something that's really practical and palatable for a, for a modern culture. Can you sort of you know talk about how you've got to that point with your teachings and um, your insights? Yeah, sure. I mean, I started writing on Instagram about. I would say two and a half, two years ago, I, w- I should say. Yeah, exactly about two years ago. I started October of 2018. So I was always, you know, writing these kind of things and um, putting it in, a, in an email and sending my friends or what, whatnot. And that went on for about 10 years until my friends got really bugged. And one of them told me, hey, you want to write this kind of stuff? Uh, there's a platform, you can do it. And he followed um, he followed Young Pueblo on Instagram 
who is also a writer in Young Pueblo, you know, now is a friend of mine, actually. So I looked at that and that kind of became an inspiration. And I thought, hey, I, I already write this kind of stuff in my journal every day. So why not just start typing on Instagram and see how that goes? And it, it kind of took off. And uh, yeah, and I, I always try to express myself the most honest way possible. Because one of the challenges with what's out there is, is that there's just so much content out there, you know, so much material out there. And uh, there's a certain terminology that comes with it, uh, you know, as you said, mindfulness, manifestation, mind, you know, meditation, um, all those things. Um, I wanted to really express them in the way I saw it because I thought that the only way to make it authentic is to to basically speak from my experience and not and consciously avoid speaking in such a way uh, or speaking that which I've learned from others, but speak just from my own experience. So that that's why it, it kind of is a mixture of all these other things, you know, a little bit of coaching, a little bit of mindfulness, a little bit of personal practice, you know, practical advice, because that's how I think. And I'm trying to just lay it down as practically as possible, as honestly as possible, because there's real challenges in, in doing that work, you know. And um, if you gloss over certain things, if you hide behind uh, fancy sounding terms um, or you convince yourself that you have arrived at a place where you have not, then it just becomes tougher. You know, the, the road just becomes longer. So I tried to speak without using any of those things and just, you know, try and keeping it really simple, really straightforward and really logical about all else, you know, questioning, mm. going step by step into it. So that's how it evolved, you know, basically. Yeah, mate. And there's a bit of, you know, there's a there's an art to that, I think, I think, Amit, in what you're saying and in what you're talking about because the, I feel like the gold is to try to get it to the masses and some of the canons or the sutras or the stuff that you might have researched or read to get to where you've got to, people aren't going to understand or, or want to take that information on in the way it's delivered. So to be able to do it in the way that you're doing it, you know, it, it takes quite a you know quite a gift, I, I'd gather. Oh, that, thanks. But I, I don't know if it's a gift. It's... Yeah, I would say it's a it's a mixture of um, just an, an, an insistence, if you will, on putting it the simplest way possible. Because I, I always like to say, if you cannot explain something simply, then that just means you don't understand it. Yeah, and yeah. I don't say that to someone else. I say that to myself. That if I'm complicating something too much, that just means I'm I'm confused about it. So I just go through this process of simplifying and putting it. Uh, you know, really coming to the point where it's just not intellectual understanding because that's what you get when you read books, when you listen to other people talk, when you read, uh, you know, ancient texts or whatever, you're not going to get practical wisdom from there. You're going to get intellectual wisdom from there. Then the work lies in translating that intellectual wisdom uh, to daily life because there's ideas galore on the internet, right? Thousands of ideas mm -hmm. out there. And ideas can make you feel comfortable because just because you can describe something, it sometimes we we settle down in that feeling that, okay, I get it because I can tell my friend about it. Uh, no, you get it when you can do it, you know? So I try to keep that as a standard uh, as, you know, don't speak about it unless you can do it. Because if you speak before you have done, then uh, firstly, this is, the foundation is cracked over there. You cannot build anything strong on, on that foundation. And it's just not fun. You know, the real fun is in learning. The real fun is in finding out the challenges which people face every single day, which I face because I'm just a regular human being. When I have a fear and I don't know what to do with that fear, what kind of questions crop up in my mind, right? When I'm trying to meditate and my mind is just um, going all over the place, what does that mean? Uh, is that meditation? Or is that a part of, um, is, is that not meditation or is that a part of meditation? So going through all those questions yourself and figuring them out and, you know, that's that, that's the enjoyable part really. And so when I speak from that place, it, it becomes more accessible, I believe. It becomes um, more doable and that people can understand that and then apply it and then be able to describe it in their own ways. So like what you are doing, for example, with your podcast and with your work, uh, anyone should be able to do that 
that learn from your own experience and then describe or share it with others. Mm. Mate, what, what's been your background in terms of, again, the intellectual wisdom that you've acquired through books and, and your personal experience, like to get to you, to get you where you are right today? Like what's sort of been your journey? Well, I mean, I started reading, uh, and as always, you know, nobody gets into this self-help and mindfulness stuff unless they go through a period of suffering, right? So the suffering which I went through was primarily my my first teacher, I should say, that opened my eyes to um, to the real world and not the world I thought was real and to the real me and not the not the me that I thought was real. So when I started looking inside, um, inside my, my own mind, initially my research or learning was, I would say, aided by you know, authors right Eckhart Tolle, um, who wrote The New Earth, and, uh, A New Earth, and what's the other book, The Power of Now, and uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, and his foundation is still alive and well, so I follow them on my Instagram too. And uh, so his books were really powerful in, in helping me kind of break through those molds I set my set for myself. And, um, you know, his writing is very convoluted, not very approachable, uh, but it's it's helpful in some way. Um, but yeah, well, he, he, I think, was like the fun, most profound influence on the way I think. And I went on to read the Tao Te Ching, um, there's another ancient Taoist text. Then there is the Hua Hu Ching. There's another ancient Taoist text. Um, then there is uh, writers like Alan Watts, if you're aware of him. He's a, he's a British, uh, English philosopher. And he, he got all the Zen wisdom from from Japan and he, he kind of from the East and kind of brought it to the West, translated it into Western concepts. And he was a, he was a pastor. Uh, so he had a background in Christianity too. So he was even kind of you know, bring mm-hmm. it all together, so to speak, East and the West. So I found him to be very influential as well. And then there were some old writers, James Allen, um, one of them. Um, so, you know, a lo- lot of people here and there, scattered wisdom. But as I said, you know, they only take you so far and you can bring the horse to the to the water, right? But you cannot make him drink the water. It's kind of like that. You, you have to do a certain amount of work yourself and you have to re- reject those works uh, at a certain point, I had to consciously say, I'm not going to read anymore. I'm not going to read what Krishnamurti says or what Eckhart Tolle says. And I got to put these things aside because my mind is filled with the with the words they said. It's It doesn't have anything original in it. My voice is, it, it sounds as if they are speaking. It's not like me are speaking. It's like me, myself speaking. So I had to like, I struggled with that a lot because I knew somewhere that as long as this doesn't become personal understanding. It's not going to be helpful. It's just not going to work out for me. It's just going to be intellectual. So the learning background is one thing. Then rejecting that background and creating your own foundation uh, is is a, is a different journey altogether. And what's that journey? I mean, like what's for for everyone? I think that's the 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 fundamental goal it is turning awareness into action. And you know. I like what you said there about, you know, stopping to read the books and then realizing that you had to find that within yourself. Can you dig a little bit deeper, mate, in terms of what that process looked like for you to get started? Absolutely. You know, when you start with meditation, you know, just, just, let's just talk about meditation because it's just one tool which we stumble upon and we all kind of practice in small ways here and there. When we talk about meditation, uh, most people, I would say, approach meditation in such a way that um, they take up a concept and then they apply it in their in their practice. Like someone says mindfulness and they would say focus on your, um, just don't think about anything. And then we sit down and try not thinking about anything. And we try that and we find we are getting distracted. And that goes on for months. And then we abandon it. We say, oh, this is not working out for me. Uh, so this is not going anywhere. And that's when we kind of deviate from the path and you know never return to it. So the approach to meditation is understanding that every time we look inside our mind, we are not going to see anything with real clarity because the mind is always moving and that mind is always affecting the body. For example, if I have a fear, right, whenever I'm afraid, it changes the way my heart heart beats. It changes the way I breathe, right? It changes the way um, 
for example, my, my palms would become clammy or my blood pressure would rise and some people would feel anxious. Others would come close to having like panic attacks uh, when they start meditating. And so that becomes a barrier in itself because the instant you look at the mind, you realize the mind and the body are both influencing each other and they are both kind of out of sync. So the mind is not connected to the body. Uh, although it is influencing it, it's not really connected. Um, there's physical strain, for instance, if my if I haven't stretched or my, if my there's pain in my shoulders or my body, my mind is going to be distracted. It's not going to be uh, focused or calm uh, or any of that. So it first starts with breathing, see, because the, the breath is a bridge between the mind and the body. So you start by breathing slowly, consciously, taking five or six breaths a minute, five second inhales, about six seconds of exhales. And when you start doing that, you realize that when you calm your breath down, your heart rate become, begins to calm down. When your heart begins to calm down, your feelings begin to relax. You know, you feel relaxed. When you feel relaxed, your emotions begin to become more controlled. When your emotions are controlled. You don't have as many confused, distracted, or um, strong, significant thoughts which take you away from the present moment. And so you discover, hey, if I breathe correctly, my mind is becoming calmer and calmer. Say, I'm developing these this connection between my mind and body naturally without really trying to do anything. All I have to do is just breathe slowly. And then you realize that there is also other aspects of our consciousness which we haven't developed. For example, I talk a lot about listening just to the sounds around you um, and just paying attention to those sounds because we are so used to paying attention to what our mind is saying that we don't know what's happening in the real world. So you pay attention to the sounds, then you pay attention to the feelings, like body sensations passing all over your body. And then you open your eyes and look around your room and try to see if there's anything new that you haven't seen in your, in your own bedroom, right? Like a speck on the wall, a mark on the carpet, a strange way uh, your, your cupboard or your table is arranged, or the way the coffee cup hasn't been moved for two days. Um, so you look at these things in your room and you realize that when you connect with these sensations around you, now your mind and body are beginning to connect with each other and you're beginning to calm down. When you practice that for a while, you realize that's only the first step of meditation. You know, you, you clear level one, so to speak. Then begins the level two, where you have to deal with your problems, examine your problems in such a way that now you can look at them objectively because your mind is now quiet. For the first time, you are prepared to look at your thoughts and not be confused, not be distracted by them, and so on. So when you look at your thoughts, when you look at your problems, take up a fear, take up a pleasure, observe it, peel it layer by layer, you have an insight into it. And that insight is like a sudden bulb going off, you know, one of those things which you realize. And sometimes you have them by reading books, sometimes you have them by listening to people. But once that happens, it's like an irreversible change. You know, you say, oh, that's why I get angry all the time when this person says such a thing. But that's why I feel jealous when I look at this person. It's because of my own insecurity. It's because of I have yeah. never paid attention to myself. So and so on, you know. So I know that was a long answer, but that's how it begins, really, is looking inwards, looking at yourself and peeling the layers of your personality one by one to the point where you begin to have insights into your own nature. Those insights bring irreversible change and that change translates to your daily life. I love it that you went there and that was your explanation because I think it's so it's such an important teaching for people starting out because often that's the hardest teaching is the ability to create space and and to to slow down and create stillness for for people as the gateway to insight and and people want to get to the insight and but don't want to do the pre-work to to get there and you describing it in levels is really important because you know it's hard for people to, to get there when they're so busy, when they're so full, when they're so preoccupied um, to get to, to the gold. Yeah. yeah. Can I say a little bit more about that? Um, you, know, you know, one of the one of the things which a lot of people get hung up on or get stuck up on, they want change too rapidly, you know. They want to change mm. their lives pretty quickly. They're like, I want, to, I want to start meditating and I want to see these changes happen uh, without, without warning, so to speak. Like, I want the changes to happen instantly. 
um, because of that urge, you know, the, to change themselves so so quickly, what happens is they rush to look at their minds. They rush to look, examine their problems. And problems are always there. You know, life is always throwing problems at you. The, the problem, the, the, the trouble about that is you cannot look at your problems right off the bat because if you immediately plunge into uh, looking at your problems, it's kind of like starting to run before you can walk. You know, you're going to fall over and over again. If you fall enough, uh, you're going to say, I don't want to do this anymore. So that's why that level one meditation is very important, which is just creating the space, connecting with your body, and kind of like grounding practice. I call it the earth in practice, connecting to the earth, because when you connect to the earth, you use the signs, the, the sounds, the sights of the earth, and the feelings of your own body. What you're really doing is you are connecting to the reality as it is. See, you, when you see something, not what your mind is showing, but what your eyes are showing you, literally, just mm. physical reality. That means you're getting connected to the natural uh, ebb and flow of things. You know, you're no longer in your mind, but you have come out of your mind and into the real world. And the real world is very quiet. It's the mind which is noisy, so to speak. So when you spend more and more time in the real world, I would say about give it a month or two at least of doing just that level one meditation. It's, there's no levels really, but it helps to, it helps to divide it like that just that body awareness connection meditation you know, breathing hearing feeling and seeing practicing them for five minutes each or a period of you know 20 minutes or 25 minutes every day doing that for a couple of months will calm your mind down enough that you now prepare that you're not now you're prepared to even look at a problem in your life because if you look up a problem before that it's going to be very hard to, go, to, to keep going so yeah so that should develop and go on from there. And I think an important, what you said then, I mean, like when you try and look at your problems or get insight and you're looking at it through a busy or an attached mind or, or you're looking at it from the ego, you're not going to get a true picture of what the real teachings, learnings or relationship to the self are because the glasses that you're looking through have been tainted. So I think that's the important part for people wanting to, wanting to get there too quick to admit. Yep, Exactly. Exactly. The glasses are tainted. Exactly. And when you have a certain thought pattern, when you have a certain you know prejudice or a belief, for instance, a very strong belief that this is how it's supposed to be, you're not in a position to be conscious of that belief. And so you're always going to act out from that belief and never see any, any issue with the way you think or the way you see the world, right? So unless you can create that separation from your mind, um, which you are too occupied with, and that separation happens when you step outside the stream of that unconscious thinking and it really takes a while to step out of that stream. But once you do, then you can look back. It's kind of like, I always like to give an example. Imagine, imagine that you are you have fallen in a river, right? And the river is taking you and the flow is really strong. And you, you're just trying to find out where the river is headed. You know, you're trying to see where my life is going, where the sea is or how the river turns or where the river falls. You have no idea, mate, because you're inside it. You know, you're going with it, so to speak. So you have to grab a branch. You have to get out on the banks. Somebody has to throw a rope for you. You know, grab, you've got to grab that rope and come out onto the onto the banks, right? Once you come out of that river, which is step outside the stream of unconscious thinking, now you can look back. And now you can say, oh, that's what's going on in me. See? But when you are in it, you have no idea what's going on. Because you're just uh, an unwitting um, participant in it, you know. So unless you get out and observe, you're not really good. You're not in a position to even understand your problem. Um, but then you can really look and then you can really understand. And once you understand, there's no going back from it. Uh, you know, you, you cannot lose your understanding once you have it. It's an irreversible change once you have that insight. It's funny you say that, man. I'm, I'm doing a course at the moment writing a little course and and i described open awareness exactly as you just sort of said as it it's like a river so it's an interesting analogy i just think it's a really good one and i hadn't heard you say that or anyone i sort of sort of got to that um in my own thoughts but i you know i think that's it's such a good analogy of the river and the thought stream as being you know 
you know, part of our awareness and our ability to get out of the out of the river and actually see things and, and see what's coming down the river is and a chance a chance to observe thoughts, feelings and emotions without becoming attached or hooked on them is a really good way to explain it. So, you know, that was great insights. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And yeah, you you're on you're spot on there. I completely agree with that, Maji. <laughs> yeah. I sort of looked at it too, and I don't know, I'd love to get your thoughts on it, but like the, it's like the, the separation of the water traveling through the river as being thoughts, feelings, and emotions are just passing by. They're not the river, they're not the river banks or they're not the river itself. They're just coming through and they'll continue to come through at different times, but they don't stay. And that's the bit with thoughts, feelings, and emotions is that they're not permanent. They're, they're passing through the river. They're not them, but we often think that they are the river and we become hooked on them as if they're going to be there forever. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, nothing nothing will last forever. You know, everything is always in a state of flux. Um, yeah, you know, it's like watching a candle burn, right? You're not really watching the same candle burn because it's not the same flame and it's not the same candle. It's it, As the wax burns, the flame is changing every instant, you know. Um, you're never really seeing the same thing ever again you're just seeing it with different eyes so not only is not only is everything changing but you are changing with it too because eventually who is the observer right who is the ego who is doing all this work um and this is where i kind of begin to separate from like the mainstream teaching in this in this in this area is that uh, the the teaching generally and i'm not saying you know your teaching especially, but any teaching generally begins with the conclusion that, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, my emotions, thoughts, and feelings, you know, and that is true, but where a person is often and at that particular point in their lives, it is very much true for them, you know, that they are their thoughts, feelings, and emotions, because who is doing, going to do all the investigative work, the observation, the self-awareness, who else is going to do all that work if not the ego? Say we, we make the ego into this enemy and we say that I want to let go of my ego, I want to eradicate the ego. I actually think the ego is our teacher because we are the ego in, in a sense. We are our own teacher because we are all these things. But as the ego kind of becomes aware of what it is doing, it begins to fail at doing those things. You know, it's, it's kind of like I give this funny example it's kind of like, you know, you're having a lunch with your with your friends, right? And you're making this chomping sound while you eat, right? And your friend says, hey, dude, you're making this chomping sound. Can you stop doing that? You know? And then suddenly, as you realize what you do, you stop doing it. And it's just gone, right? You never do it again because you caught yourself doing something and now it's not going to repeat. The, the ego works kind of like that. Once it's made aware or once it becomes aware of its own behavior of its own nature it cannot carry out that nature so the beautiful thing about that is you don't have to bring an external agency like um, you know the universal consciousness the supreme godhead or the brahman or whatever you want to call it universal consciousness you don't have you don't need those agents in order to bring change in your life but most people start with those agents and they say oh i'm this is not me, but the real self is free, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I I cannot refuse that. I say that no, the real self is pretty much you, with those with those petty ideas, with those small ideas, with those jealousies, fears, anxieties. That's pretty much you. That's a, that's the real self. The beauty of that is, once that real self becomes aware of those things, it is going to start transforming itself, just by the virtue of understanding what it is, uh, and that's the that's the beauty of. Um, self-transformation is that you can do it yourself. You don't have to hold anybody's hand. You don't need a teacher. You don't need a guru. Um, you can, if you believe strongly enough that you can do it, you absolutely can do it just to yourself. So, you, you know, do you think of it that that teaching that you're sort of saying about the ego, which, you know, I do agree with, is it's not the ego itself that's the problem, that it's our relationship to the ego that can be problematic. But in, if we build the right relationship to the self and to the ego that we can actually you know, use it in a way that's of benefit, benef- of benefit? Absolutely, because <clears throat> until the ego is highly active, right, um, it is in charge. The ego is always in charge. Um, and when it is in charge, you got to be in a certain, 
comfortable position with who is in charge, right? So we, we are always in this position of uh, managing our problems. And, and that managing is what I call, uh, you know, developing a good relationship with your ego. So you don't try to eradicate the ego, of course not, but you have to kind of, you know, be in a place where you're kind of managing your problems until you can fully solve them. For for instance, yeah, if I get angry at, if I'm getting really angry at my boss, for example, I'm at work and I have a toxic work environment, my boss is a bully and etc. I have to, I cannot lose my temper, right? So I have to tell my ego to kind of eat its pride, so to speak, bite its tongue, make sure that it doesn't say anything which is which is going to get itself into deeper trouble. So in that sense, I have to, but at the same time, not lose my own sanity, not not lose my own self-confidence or uh, my self-esteem, right? So I have to have that balancing relationship with the ego to say that, okay, you may get bullied, you may get insulted, but it's okay. We are working through this problem. We will create a boundary for now and make sure that we aren't, you know, we aren't put in, in that uncomfortable position every day. And then slowly as you work through it, work through that, a fear that comes up, that anxiety that comes up when you manage your boss or whoever is bothering you is around you, um, then you begin to bring those boundaries down slowly, eventually. Because when you find that freedom that you can be in the moment and not be afraid, that you don't need a boundary anymore, you don't need that protection anymore, and then uh, then the behavior of the ego gets naturally transformed. So I absolutely agree. You know, we have to have that relationship with the ego in order to basically manage the problems such that we don't get overrun by them essentially until we solve those problems and then we don't need uh, we don't need any kind of management really then we act from intuition then we act from subconscious the subconscious mind we act without a filter the ego is a filter between us and the other people and the world right that filter once that filter becomes more and more diaphanous so to speak more and more transparent you can begin to interact directly with the people as you approach life as if as you are. There's no pretenses, there's no fear, there's no hiding behind anything. You just present yourself as you are. You know, you become fearless, um, so to speak. Yeah, and as you're saying that, I mean, I'm like, I've got this image or this visualization of the ego almost as a mask or some armor to often protect us in situations that will use the ego in in you know, in many different forms of sarcasm, um, you know, of not enough, not feeling enough at that particular time of surrender um, to, to, to keep us safe in many moments. But also sometimes that robs us of our authenticity or us showing up as we truly are in that moment because we're not feeling safe. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely true. Yeah. Mate, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about why – why have we created such a disconnected relationship to ourselves, and why are we? So, why is the mind so busy, and we're so reactive, and you know, and mindless in many ways now? Well, see, that goes into that question goes into the nature of the ego itself, right? Uh, because why? What is the ego? Essentially, that's that's what the question is. How did the ego arise? And yeah. How did we get to this point where we are so disconnected from each other? so disconnected from nature, for instance. Um, what has happened there? So if you look at, if you had to look at a little bit about, a little bit at, you know, evolution, evolutionary biology and how it works without going into the science of it, because I'm not a scientist. But if you just look at, say like, uh, um, so essentially, well, how did the ego come about, right? Like if you look at, if you have any pets in the house or if you have any, animals in the house or if you if you have watched an animal ever you realize that they live a very simple life see they respond to the situation as the situation arises there is no confusion of any kind about what to do what not to do there is no they don't have really any psychological problems so to speak um they're very clear you know they have they feel physical danger whenever there is physical danger they respond to it accordingly when they're hungry they eat when you want to sleep, they go to sleep. Your life is pretty simple, right? That's because in the in the animal world, in the animal kingdom, there is a significant amount of simplicity in the way they lead their life, right? There is no necessity to organize a whole lot because 
their life as it is is extremely simple, right? It is there's only so much you can do um, if you're an animal. So much, only so much you have to do. But contrast that with the human society. The, with the human society is extremely complex. Uh, there's way too many social issues going on, way too many problems going on, way too many layers. The, the social structure itself is complex. The human life itself is really long. And so you have to gather a tremendous amount of information, learn a tremendous amount of things. You are simply going to college until you're 18 years of age. Uh, and so you're get, amassing a tremendous amount of information, and organizing that information in the mind. So the human brain needs to have this kind of an organizer, see? And that organizer is basically the ego. The ego is nothing special. The ego is simply an uh, organizer which we have evolved with. And that's why the ego is part of our nature. Every human being is going to have it simply by the virtue of the amount of information they have to manage, simply the amount of human relationships they have to handle, uh, the identities they have to balance, the roles they have to play in society, and all of that. So when you have that organizer, that organizer is going to try and organize this life, right? It's going to say, how, how do I want to approach my work life? How do I want to approach my um, personal life? Because of the tremendous amount of information that there is, it has to begin to kind of create conceptual understanding. It has to develop these lessons it can remember. And those lessons come in the form of, say, religion. They come in the form of ideologies. They come in the form of political systems, social systems. They come in the form of uh, knowledge that is passed down from your parents to you. So, so when my father or my mother says, this is how things work, right? When my society says, this is how a human being is supposed to exist in society, I just, the ego simply takes those things and notes them down and says, all right, I'm going to do that because the sheer amount of information that is available to me, it's impossible for me to figure out what's right, what's wrong, right? So it's simply um, going to gather all that and follow along. And that following along creates this laziness, creates this barrier where now you have a whole lot of belief systems, a whole lot of conceptual ideas stored in your brain, which may or may not be true, but you take them for the truth because you just simply don't have the time to process all that. Uh, combine that with the million, the billions of egos that exist on the planet, and you have uh, abstraction layers between different human beings um, based on their nationality, which country they are born in, their religion, their way of life, uh, all of it, right? And the, 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 the sum total of that information manifests as the ego, uh, as the division between two human beings, as a division between different cultures, between different countries, different nationalities. So instead of seeing yourself as somebody who is a human being, uh, you see yourself as an American or you see yourself as an Indian or an Australian. So that's where that's where the divisions come from. It's a natural process of living life and it's going to be like that for millions of years to come. And the work always is going to be to undo all that and to see through all that and to come to this um, simplification where you can meet life without all these filters. Hmm. And has that, has that been intensified a bit, you know, especially in the last 50 to 100 years because people have got so many options and sort of as if they're lacking a bit of purpose because there's so many options to live certain ways. Whereas back, you know, back in, you know, cultures, you know, thousands of years ago, life was a lot simpler. It was around survival. It was around protection and staying safe where most people feel like they'll survive. So their, their basic needs are being met. So then they become lost in what their purpose on this planet is to do. And that creates us, you know, immense suffering because we're actually not sure. Whereas in nature, bees know what they're there to do. The birds know their purpose. They're there to, you know, to live, to, you know, to reproduce. And it's a very simple existence, but it, it allows them to be more present with less noise in what they're doing. Absolutely, man. Because, I mean, you have, if you just look at the amount of information that I was reading up on this somewhere, the amount of information that the human mind 
consumes now is uh, extremely high. You know, a tremendous amount of information in the last 15 years because of technological advancement, uh, because of the internet in the past you know, 20, 30 years um, is just too much. You know, we are not built for consuming that kind of information, having these kind of extensions to our own personality. Like a cell phone we carry right now, it's like, um, it's an extension of the human brain. You know, it's a, it's a second computer, which is at our fingertips, essentially. Um, so we, our brain is not equipped to handle that amount of information. It's, it, it, it gets overwhelmed. And so when it gets overwhelmed, uh, there's only one thing left to do, which is to escape, right? So it's going to mm. get into seeking some kind of pleasure, some distraction, you know, get into alcohol or drugs or whatever, and basically escape the problems of life because the stress is just so tremendous uh, because there's just so much to handle. Like if you just look at general economies, right? It, it's like so many people don't have jobs and so many other people are overworked, right? A lot of people in the world don't have enough uh, sanit- sanitation, not clean drinking water. And the other half of the world is dying because of overexposure to harmful chemicals. You know, they're dying of cancer because they're using too many uh, products which have dangerous chemicals in them, right? So there is excess on one hand and there is lack or scarcity on the other hand. And so this is happening because of the complexity of the human society and it it's keeps on increasing. It's, it's going to keep up, keep going up even more. The population, the human population has doubled, um, I believe since 1970 or something, uh, which is incredible if you think of it. And it's going to keep uh, increasing even more. So you're absolutely right there. You know, and this is the recent complexity of the human life has definitely led to us forgetting um, how to connect with nature, how to connect with other human beings. And it just has made the problem even worse. When, when the days were simpler, these problems definitely didn't, like when my parents were young, they didn't have these issues. They had a much simpler life. They had a much stable life. They spent a lot of time out in, you know, spending, playing with their friends or when they were young or spending time with their families. And now we are, we live in these isolated silos almost where we don't want to be disturbed because we don't know what will happen if we are disturbed. And what do you see, Mick? Because I agree fully on, on what you're saying, but what do you sort of see as being our path forward with, with, with these teachings of self-transformation, with our need to connect more with nature or to simplify? What do you see as being the really core or fundamental building blocks for us to, to live with more, you know, peace, harmony, compassion, gratitude in our lives? I'll be honest with you. I, I usually hesitate to translate um, personal practice of self-awareness and meditation and self-improvement to any kind of societal change. Um, yep. I, I usually balk at drawing that, um, drawing that parallel because you know, a lot of us have this urge of going out and changing society. You know, we, we struggle to change society because we have struggled to change ourselves. And so fundamentally, my responsibility, as, as I'm talking to you right now, fundamentally, my responsibility is to make sure that that, that transformation, which I'm talking about or alluding to, happens in me. You know, that's my primary responsibility. Because if it happens in me, then it will have no choice but to kind of, um, you know, spill over into the lives of people around me, in my family, in my friends, or I may say something on the internet and other people will read. So if that change happens in you, it's going to spread. You, know, you don't have to do anything to spread it. Um, it, it is a natural process and uh, it, one human mind always influences deeply another human mind, especially when it when it connects with that human mind. So our responsibility is to simply keep changing ourselves. Um, what happens in society is is not for up, us to decide, because if we start deciding that, if we start moving in that direction, then it becomes an overwhelming problem to solve. See, um, all these things which are happening in the world right now, global warming or uh, folks in different countries, um, you know, the, the elected leaders not caring about what happens to you know, basic human needs, basic decency, etc. 
when you look at those things, it kind of creates a lot of anxiety in us, you know, because we, we have gone off into the into the place where I want to change the world and I feel small that I cannot affect all these winds that are blowing at a global scale, see? Uh, so our, our path is not to affect those winds. Our path is to change our own lives. And those winds will change if um, more enough people undertake this honest journey in uh, in doing their best. And it's not that we ha- everybody has to practice self-awareness. It's not that at all. Uh, it's not that everyone has to meditate, but that everyone has to find a way to do what they love to do, um, to find their own drifts, to find the direction in which they are naturally moving, and then do that. Because if you do something that you love to do, then your work will be such that it creates harmony in the world. Um, it's not that spiritual leaders are going to create harmony in the world. Well, there are some spiritual teachers out there who are uh, wrecking havoc, you know, creating chaos in the world. So spirituality is not the answer to every problem out there is. Um, and I would definitely not say that it is. Um, but the, the, the answer to those problems is most human beings or a large percentage of human beings finding the time, the ability to to be able to do something that they love. Because when they are able to do that, then they will find meaning in their own lives. Then they will find satisfaction in their own lives. And when you find satisfaction and meaning in your own, in your own life, you're not jealous about what other people are doing. You don't want to wreck other people's lives. You don't want, you don't become insecure and, um, you know, have these, weak notions of changing society um, because, you know, you can see all, the most harm in society has been done by people who wanted to create a revolution, you know, who wanted to change everything. Um, and that's me, that, that is not always, or that is not often the answer. The answer is, are you doing something that you love to do? Because if you do, then everything you do will spread that love in society. And everybody who comes in contact with you will, will feel that. Uh, and will be inspired to do that. And when they're inspired to do that, they would give space to other human beings. They would love other human beings and allow them to find those things too. Um, and that would reduce all the selfish problems, selfishness problems, aggression problems, violence in the world, simply by doing something that gives you satisfaction and meaning in your own life. So it's not meditation, self-awareness, enlightenment, those things which will bring peace, but doing things that you love and um, in some sense, really, you know, minding your own business and being happy in your own life. Mm. It's, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful full circle on the podcast, I think, Amit, because, you know, it starts with, you know, you talking about you, we can read all the books we want, but we eventually have to do the work ourselves. And then coming back into this space that you're starting to talk about, you know, to create change and, and real shifts in, in society that we have to start with ourselves, and we have to start with, you know, with, with us and doing our self work. And, and often, again, that, that can be a difficult thing for people because they want to fix other people and they want to do things for others, but don't want to go again, what you've spoken about throughout the whole podcast is to go inside and, and build that relationship with the self. And, you know, I, I think the meditation and the self awareness piece, Amit, is almost a building block to, for, for a lot of people in finding what they love, finding that thing that's their meaning, that 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 those tools can actually help them get there if they're lost. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And just to add on to that, the, the end result, or I should say the end goal, is not to live a life which is full of stress, strain, and control, right? The, the end goal, if you will, is to f- find a place where you can... Um, you know, wake up every day, feel great about what you're doing and feel excited about what you're doing and use your intuition in, in your life to, to get through the day, uh, to, to act mm-hmm. from the subconscious mind, which means spending more time in that state of flow, really. Um, that is a beautiful aspect of this because you know, when you do this work, you get to a point where things begin to happen on their own. You see, you don't have to force them to happen. You don't have to struggle to go against the against the current or you know put yourself through a tremendous amount of trouble and heartache and um, misery to to find to to reach your goals or to accomplish something but really kind of get into that cruise mode you know you're going to cruise along 
um, find that easy access to your creativity, find that find that opening into beauty in your own life. And that I think is is the ultimate goal to to step out of the way and let life guide you um, to go with it and, and to see that that's the natural way in which you are already going. That I think is uh, the most beautiful discovery uh, one can make for oneself and by do, by doing this meditation and self awareness work. Mate, that's beautiful. That's absolute. I think that's the perfect spot to to finish this conversation, mate. I've really appreciated your insights and just your articulation of of ego of self and and just of of the work you do. I think it was really beautifully put. And you know, I was really privileged to be able to someone that's followed you on Instagram for quite a while to be actually have a conversation and talk about, you know, what you're doing and how you do it. So I really appreciate it, Amit. Thanks, Luke. I'm glad glad we connected and thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed talking to you and 